Greetings, all you calculus students. This is Mr. Meiring coming to you digitally to uh, discuss the fundamental theorem of calculus and its proof. Uh, it's more of a pseudo proof, and I'll explain why in a second, but um, it will give us a general idea of how we should handle uh, FTC problems and why we get to use um, the fundamental theorem of calculus to do our definite integrals. So, hopefully, you recall the two main parts of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, this is our indefinite integral part. Uh, where g prime of x is equal to f of x. Um, that's true if g of x is the integral of f. And we use that down here with our definite integral where we get to just find the antiderivative and plug in our limits of integration in the correct order. So uh, to discuss that, the proof of that, we're going to do kind of a little example here. And so I call it a pseudo proof because you know, that we're using a specific example of 3x squared and 3 rectangles. Uh, actual proof would have just a general function um, and an n number of rectangles, but I find that this does a little bit better job of just kind of giving you some concrete examples where we can. So we're going to estimate the definite integral from a to b of 3x squared dx using Riemann sums with 3 rectangles, where the sample points are calculated in an interesting way where they're calculated using the MVT on g of x. And I'll explain that as we get to it. But uh, g of x is, as defined previously with FTC, the integral of f of x dx. Now, that means that we're trying to do the integral of 3x squared dx, which is equal to x cubed plus c. And so that's the g of x that we're referring to here. So, uh, you know, just like most other problems, where you, here's f of x, uh, 3x squared, that we're going to be finding the area underneath. And so we're going to find out what our interval is here. We're going to call that a and b. So this is a and this is b. Uh, and then we're going to split that up into three even parts. So as we split this up here, we're going to say here's this spot, and here is that other spot. We're going to call this x sub 1 and this x sub 2, and that's already labeled as a and b. Um, you know, then, of course, the problem is that we need to figure out what sample point we're going to use to determine the height of the rectangle for each of these three intervals. Right? And we're told that the sample points have to be calculated using the mean value theorem, which we've recently discussed. So mean value theorem on g of x. So we're going to have to work with x cubed plus c. And so that's this function down here. I'm calling this g of x, which equals x cubed plus c. And so this is our c value right here. It doesn't matter what that is, but um, it's some constant. And so. This is still going to be our A value. This is still going to be our B value. So here's A and here is B. We're going to use the same, the, the same intervals, X sub 1. So I'm going to do my best to copy those down here. And X sub 2, so those at the same value. So this is X sub 1 and this is X sub 2. So uh, what it means by the MVT is just what we did the other day. So if you have an endpoint here and an endpoint here, you can connect those with a straight line. That would be your average rate of change. Connect these. This is your average rate of change. Connect these points, and that's your average rate of change. So what you're looking for is the average rate of change on each of these intervals and where the slope is parallel to it. So the slope's going to be parallel right about here. So I'm going to go down and I'm going to make that C sub 3, our sample point. Find my slope is parallel roughly here. It's kind of hard to tell, but we're just getting the idea. Uh, this is C sub 2. And then over here, this is going to be C sub 1. So with those, those values then, we can write out some rules that we've discussed from our MVT. So here's G of x. And the mean value theorem states that the I rock has to equal to A rock. So that means that G prime of C sub 1 has to equal G of X1 minus G of A down here all over X sub 1 minus 
A, you know, change in Y over change in X, the average rate of change. So, um, but since we did this kind of like in a Riemann sum process, this distance here that is actually going to be called delta X, this distance here is going to be delta X, and that's going to be also delta X. So this can be rewritten as G prime of C sub 1 equals G of X1 minus G of A all over just delta X instead. And we can do that with C sub 2 and C sub 3. So we'll write those out. G prime of C sub 2 equals G of X2 minus G of X1 all over delta X, we're going to call that. And then G prime of C sub 3 equals G of B, the right endpoint down here, minus G of X sub 2 all over delta X. So essentially we have three different mean value theorem equations set up to find out whatever this C value should be, just like the mean value theorem says. Now what's going to happen is that in order to do the Riemann sums, you're going to jump up to this value, and I'm going to call that C sub 1, take that value up here and use it, C sub 2, and this value here and use it, call it C sub 3. We're going to use those values to calculate the three-part Riemann sum. So I go up to this spot, and then that becomes the height of my first rectangle. Go up to this spot. That calculates the height of my second. Go up to here. This calculates the height of my third rectangle. So that is how we calculate our Riemann sum. So coming back to the Riemann sum part of it then, back up to this, we're going to set up that equation. We're going to come back to use this stuff. We're going to come back to use the MVT work. But... Um, we're going to look at the Riemann sum. So I'm going to call that F sub 3 for fundamental uh, theorem of calculus, sub 3. We don't ever, ever use F any other time, so that's why I kind of chose it. And that is going to equal, you know, just going straight Riemann sums, nothing else. That would be F of C sub 1 times delta X plus F of C sub 2 times delta X plus F of C sub 3 times delta x. Now that's our equation that we did the other day. Now, now is where we get to put everything together. Since f of x equals g prime of x, then we can do the following. Because we created this relationship between f and g based on our integral, that means that I can change some of these inputs. So f of 3 is actually equal to not f of c sub 1, because that's f of c sub 1, but I could call it g prime of c sub 1 instead. So this turns into a g prime because of this relationship. So g prime of c sub 1 times delta x. And then you can do that with the others. g prime of c sub 2 times delta x plus g prime of c sub 3 times delta x which as we go about our substitution then, now we take another look and I can do better than writing g prime of c sub 1 based on these equations that we wrote above. Again, the sample points are created from the mean value theorem. So g prime of c sub 1 is actually g of x sub 1 minus g of a over delta x, but that's being multiplied by delta x plus g prime of c sub 2, that's this up here. So that's g of x sub 2 minus g of x sub 1 all over delta x being multiplied by delta x. And then we add to it our third one, g of b minus g of x sub 2 all over delta x still multiplied by another delta x. And you can kind of see what's going to happen here. This delta x is going to cancel here. These are going to cancel. Every single one of those delta x's are going to cancel. And so what we end up with is that this f of 3, our Riemann sum, our Riemann sum is now based on these values that we have left, 
So g of x sub 1 minus g of a plus this. So g of x sub 2 minus g of x sub 1 plus g of b minus g of x sub 2. And you can kind of see a little bit more of what we can do. I'm subtracting g of x sub 2. I have a positive g of x sub 2, so those cancel. I have a positive g of x sub 1 and a negative g of x sub 1, so those cancel. And what we're left with is a negative g of a plus g of b. And that's all it's reduced down to. And so that f of 3 is equivalent to our definite integral from a to b of f of x with respect to x. And that equals whatever is left here. So g of b minus g of a. And that's, it all works down to just that. That's it right there. That's that first part of the, or second part rather, of the fundamental theorem of calculus. The definite integral of f of x from a to b is g of b minus g of a. Now, you know, what we've done before when we've done this relationship is that we've approximated, but if you extrapolate this work to any number of rectangles, so not just three, but if I were to do n rectangles, instead, I would have a lot more of these calculations, an n amount of those calculations, but every single one of those things would be able to be substituted by the mean value theorem work on the, that much smaller interval. Every single one of those delta x's would cancel. Every single one of these types of values would cancel out again still. So you'd still be left with g of b minus g of a. So go one step farther. If you go to an infinite amount of rectangles, that's when we got to say that our approximation was exactly equal to our definite integral. And with an infinite amount of rectangles, it's still going to cancel out to be g of b minus g of a. So therefore, that's why this is your fundamental theorem of calculus. So um, by, by request, I, I was told to put something more exciting than the fundamental theorem of calculus in here. I'm not sure what that possibly could be. But um, here, here's, a, here's an old school picture that I found. Um, if you want to see Mr. Meiring hard at work in his math class, in eighth grade, this is him for you. Uh, you can thank Mr. Cater for the picture he took of me, um, a very photogenic subject. But uh, there's your little uh, uh, golden egg uh, for the fundamental theorem of calculus proof. So again, you can use it, and now you know why. Thank you very much.